Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stu again, and we are back looking at the Federal Railroad Administration's high-speed rail corridors. In this video, we will return to the Southeast High-Speed Rail Corridor with a closer look at the R2R project, Richmond, Virginia to Raleigh, North Carolina. Just a little background, the Southeast High-Speed Rail Corridor was one of the original five created in 1992 meant to connect Washington, D.C. and Charlotte, North Carolina, via Richmond, Virginia. That has expanded greatly since to include all the Southeast coastal states and we will cover the entire thing eventually. I have previously looked at sections from Washington DC to Richmond and between Charlotte and Atlanta, Georgia. If you haven't seen those videos, check them out. Links are in the description. The R2R plan is quite advanced and nearing implementation on the southern end. Let's see what the federal government has in store. Through an agreement with freight rail company CSX, the agencies involved have purchased a lengthy portion of abandoned CSX right-of-way, the S-Line. This section runs roughly from Petersburg, Virginia to Norlina, North Carolina. That will be hooked into existing CSX freight rail right-of-way on either end, which will be improved where possible. Let's quickly dig into some neato details. First of all, this 162 mile upgraded line will be grade separated the entire way between Richmond and Raleigh. Alignment on about 100 miles of that will be adjusted to accommodate 110 mile per hour travel. CSX retains trackage rights, which is probably why they didn't aim for 125 miles per hour when it appears to be attainable. The line will not be electrified and mostly single tracked, although passing sightings will cover about one third of its length. Overall, it appears to be a competent commuter rail line projected to cut rail travel time by 35% between Raleigh and Richmond. This conforms with the FRA's vision of quote unquote high speed rail in the United States, 110 miles per hour diesel electric 70 to 75 mile per hour average speed if we're lucky. However, on this channel, we ask the question, given the billions of dollars in many years it will take, why not leapfrog that paradigm and go straight to true high speed rail with the goal of averaging 125 to 150 miles per hour. This premise was considered for this route and rejected. I'll be using some parts of the S line route that were also rejected. Environmental review and community engagement can put many restrictions on a project. However, I can set those aside as I manipulate the world in 3D space or from the satellite view. So let us now imagine high-speed rail from Richmond, Virginia to Raleigh, North Carolina. First, let's start with the metros involved. On the north end, you have Richmond, Virginia. This is the Virginia state capital and has a metro population of 1.3 million. City population is 226,000. Richmond is the second largest metro in Virginia behind Virginia Beach. Richmond is about 100 miles from Washington DC and Northeast Corridor Rail Service. Transit in the Richmond area takes the form of local bus, regional bus, and bus rapid transit provided by GRTC. Intercity bus service is offered by Amtrak and several private companies. On the southern end, we have Raleigh, North Carolina. Another capital city, Raleigh's metro population is 1.5 million. Raleigh is part of the larger Raleigh-Durham area, which has a population of 2.4 million. Raleigh's city population is 480,000. Raleigh is also its state's second largest metro, this time behind Charlotte. We will investigate a connection between Raleigh and Charlotte in a following video. Raleigh Transit is through Go Raleigh, which provides bus service. They're also currently working on several bus rapid transit lines. Between Richmond and Raleigh is a collection of smaller cities and towns that I'll mostly leave for regional services. Before we start, let's talk tech. This brief assumes a tilting train like the Alstom Avelia Liberty that may be entering service with Amtrak soon on the Northeast Corridor. We'll be assuming a top speed of 186 miles per hour, which is top speed for tilting trains. 
We will start with our train coming into Richmond Main Street Station from the north. Why Main Street? The Virginia Passenger Rail Association's longer-term goals include splitting passenger service in the Richmond area between Main Street and Staples Mill, which is currently the main Richmond Amtrak station. Hypothetical high-speed rail time between Washington, D.C. and Richmond Main Street is 55 minutes on partially new alignment. Check out that video to see how I came to that conclusion. The R to R plan includes crossing the James River in the current alignment with a new double tracked bridge. R to R will be constrained to 79 miles per hour here, sharing track with freight. Our high speed rail train on separate tracks will be similarly constrained due to the geometry of that right of way, but slightly faster due to active tilt. There is enough room in the right of way for both sets of tracks. That continues for 12 miles before reaching a section of abandoned S-Line. The R to R Tier 1 study took a pass on it. We won't. Reasons, it's faster, less constrained, and a little bit shorter. The transition onto that will occur at 90 miles per hour through several homes in a residential neighborhood. After that, it's mostly woodland for about seven miles, during which 125 mile per hour cruise would be no problem. The route would then transition back to the active CSX right of way at 90 miles per hour with a couple more structures as victims. The slower speed is not an issue because our first stop in Petersburg, Virginia is coming up. Petersburg is a small city of 33,000, but the Virginia State Campus is right next to the station. The area around the station and the school also have available land to make use of the transit connection. All that and relative high speed to the south from this point makes it an okay place to stop. The 22 miles from Richmond would take 17 minutes. That's a 77 mile per hour average. Petersburg to Washington, D.C., an hour and 14 minutes, 106 mile per hour average. South of here, the R to R route remains relatively slow and circuitous. We're going to try more abandoned S line to start speeding up more quickly. Leaving Petersburg to the southwest, that will require a new crossing of the Appomattox River and then just barely missing the local Whataburger. Whew. That was a close one. This will achieve 125 miles per hour once again before the R2R rejoins us from the left after traveling 50% farther to get there. Around here we intercept Interstate 85. R2R continues southwest, mostly in the S-Line right-of-way. As mentioned, that is planned to a 110 mile per hour standard. This is rural land and could be improved further with several greenfield deviations. However, running parallel to the S line from here to Henderson, North Carolina, nearly 80 miles away, is the absurdly over-engineered Interstate 85. This route features curve radii consistently in the two miles plus range and a median between 80 and 160 feet wide. That is good for 175 miles per hour or more the whole way to Henderson with a tilting train. As a result, we will utilize that rather than attempt to improve the S line further. At Henderson, I-85 continues southwest toward Durham, so we will transition to US-1, which takes the form of a freeway for nine miles here. Geometry allows this to occur at about 135 miles per hour. South of Henderson will rejoin the R to R S line route briefly since it affords decent speed through the area. A 15 mile full speed greenfield option is available here, but it's not enough distance to make it worthwhile. Part of that would be a Western bypass of Franklinton, North Carolina, which we will utilize to avoid the R to R routes slower geometry through there. This newly cut route would then join US-1 in the median on Viaduct. US-1 is a funny roadway here, part freeway, part divided highway, part strode, but its geometry can afford 135 mile per hour travel with a tilting train, and its median can support elevated tracks for about 11 miles until it is no longer needed. 
It is nearly entirely commercially zoned over that stretch, making it suitable for the purpose. In Wake Forest, North Carolina, there is a possible site for an elevated station two miles from downtown, next to 90 acres of available land. We'll skip it in this video, but it brings up the subject of additional regional stops along such a line. Not many, as this is a heavily rural area. However, Wake Forest could be useful as a suburban commuter stop about 15 miles from Raleigh, similar to the relationship between Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia. 10 miles northeast of downtown Raleigh, this route would rejoin the R2R plan and stick to it the rest of the way. This is quite slow, only about 60 miles per hour with a tilting train. Unfortunately, US-1 outlives its usefulness, becomes US-401, and then turns into a meandering eight-lane boulevard. Another option would be a nine-mile tunnel, which seems pricey given the approach we've used for the rest of the route. Even at slow speed, Raleigh is no easy task, as a new route has two rail yards to navigate around. In the R2R plan, this entails crossing Capitol Boulevard at the CSX Raleigh Yard. From there, the path would join Norfolk Southern right-of-way, which is quite narrow. Some structures would be sacrificed to wedge two electrified tracks next to the freight track, but it's possible. That winds its way through the northwest corner of downtown Raleigh on a funky elevated path before rejoining CSX in a big curve near Raleigh Union Station. From there, a backup maneuver would be required to reach the station. It's not the easiest solution, but a tunnel doesn't seem any easier. Anyway, we've made it to Raleigh from Richmond. Let's check travel times. For these 152 miles, I have a time of 1 hour 21 minutes with the stop in Petersburg. That's an average of 112 miles per hour. That compares favorably to the R to R plan, which would get travel time down to 2 hours 14 minutes. High Speed Rail Washington DC to Raleigh I have at 261 miles, with 2 hours 18 minutes possible at an average of 113 miles per hour. In the various Southeast High Speed Rail Corridor studies, that is currently projected to land at 4 hours and 22 minutes, so definitely a big difference there. What is demand like? Amtrak carries about 1,400 passengers a day into and through the region. Of course, not all of that stops or originates in the region. I have regional nonstop flights at 34 a day with about 1,500 seats per day. Time competitiveness with flying is good when accounting for an airport time penalty of 45 minutes. A rough guess, that puts a reasonable ceiling on regional flight capture at 55% or 840 seats a day. The main road corridor connecting to Washington, D.C. is Interstate 95. I-85 serves the same function between Raleigh and Richmond. Combined, daily minimum traffic on those is 62,000 vehicles. Reasonable maximum capture there is 7%, all factors considered. That produces a maximum theoretical road vehicle capture of 4,300 trips per day. That gives a total very rough estimate of a maximum of 6,500 trips per day along this rail corridor at the speed supposed here with current populations. That is roughly 2.4 million trips a year and about 20% of the volume carried by Amtrak on the NEC. The R2R study doesn't give figures for this specific section, but estimates ridership of 4 million trips a year, Washington, D.C. to Atlanta on a much slower route. Before we get to cost, let's quickly go over my estimation algorithm and some sample results to show it can produce reasonable ballpark figures. Outside of the viaduct across the Appomattox River and a portion of US-1, we're fairly light on structures. That results in an estimate for this 152 mile portion between Richmond and Raleigh of $12.1 billion. That is $79 million per mile. Combined with the estimate from the DC to Richmond video, that gives a total of $28.1 billion for the 261 miles. 
Based on cost estimates in the R2R study compared to allocated funds, the 110 mile per hour version between Virginia and North Carolina could end up costing over $7 billion. What do you think? Is it worth it? Should it be even faster or is the R2R plan adequate? Let me know in the comments. Plenty more videos are on the way, so keep an eye out for those, including special content for the holidays. Friend of the channel Rhode Island Roadrunner has started producing videos about connecting with nature via transit. Link in the card and description if you're interested in those. Also keep in mind, super thanks are available. To the end of the year, those funds will go toward more computing power to support more involved renders. Check out the button below the video for that. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway.